there, there are elements people don't pay attention to in ideas around property. And what I mean by that is, one of the, thi one of the ways we try to, of course, av to avoid reality is to create an inflated version of ourselves. And it's really funny, this, this, this element, because I, I- The I, illusory hierarchy. The illusory hierarchy, but also in my first book where I, I talked about the very notion of treating as real the notion of superiority. Right. right? These, yeah, that's- That's the illusion those, there, yeah. right? And, 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 and the thing that's really striking, I mean- uh, So your book is, was the really f first book in the 1990s, outside the Marxist tradition, that in, in philosophy, that focused on- you know, the core problem, what I regard as one of the core problems of philosophy, the problem of ideology. Well, it, 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 it does, but the thing that's funny about it is that um, at the time, many people actually, uh, actually uh, responded to the book in a very strange way, because uh, a lot of the discussions at that time were basically, I, uh, 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 among one group was, how do you get Marx and Foucault together? Right, right? yeah. And then another group is, is the analytical philosophers, and right. the question is, what do you see as the resources to, to, to resuscitate or, or to build on in, liberal, in liberalism and liberal political theory? And the thing that I noticed at the time is there's something missing in all of those formulations. You know, every, every peop, it, it created a system in which people are talked about Mm. but have no points of view, no experience, no way of actually popping up in our actual relationships with each other. And one of the things I'd argued in the, so I decided to look at the question of how we can convince ourselves that there, there, there is no one else in the world around us. Right. And, that, and, right, and, and it's very striking because, you know, one of the things about Fanon and other people don't realize is Fanon actually argues that one of the major sources of mental illness is narcissism. Mm. because it requires convincing yourself that you don't need anybody. It's all about you. Mm. Well, there are forms of bad faith that go in two directions. One is the narcissistic one. It's all mm. about me. It's not about anybody else. But there's the other extreme, which is I'm completely nothing. I'm not mm. worthy. I'm, I'm, I'm crap. Mm. And, of course, the two then find marriages with each other. Right. It's symbiotic, and it produces a whole bunch of, 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 of surprises. The thing that's funny about it, of course, is that uh, there are people, when they would read that book, don't realize the extent to which it was actually the way we just talked about uh, Quine and James. Uh, it actually was not seeing, arguing against Marxism. It was arguing that the dominant Marxism of the time was, was collapsing into an anti-humanism. Hmm. And there are people... And Structural post, Mar so this gets to Gramsci. Structural yeah. Marxism versus the kind of Marxism that Gramsci well, pushed for, which was that recognized that all humans have agency and was yeah. informed by the master-slave dialectic. And also bad structural Marxism, because you yeah. see, the thing about it is I'm not against structure or structuralism. Right. The problem I had is what I call stupid structuralism, which is to look at things like they're just scaffoldings and they're overdeterminate and so forth. Whereas rule-based, the understanding that rules, are, rules produce rules, but they're not in closed systems. And rules, you know, it should be a sine qua non of an account of rules that following a rule is only possible if you have agency. Right. And, and yeah. And that, that's the thing I was arguing for. I was just saying, why not have a more creative sense of structure that connects how people actually live? So this is what one sees in the, 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 the requirement, this is what you see in the um, sociology literature on practices is that is, there's more of a recognition that you need a creative notion of structure, mm -hmm. a notion of structure that allows for revolution, for instance, mm -hmm. um, that you could, uh, but, so this gets to a puzzlement. Uh, this explains, I guess this explains for me uh, why you deny something for which you are always credited. Um, you always deny that you uh, are an Afro-pessimist. But oh, now I understand. Absolutely not yeah, an Afro pessimist. Yeah, yeah. But right. but you're often credited with Afro pessimism. Oh, I know. Yeah. I know. But I know. but Afro pessimism I know. I know. is a fully structural, locked in view. Right. In yeah. fact, they collapse. They the problem I have with them is that they're the imposition on, of ontology onto the human being, and the, the well, it's a rigid structures. It is. Um, and and if your conception of structures and of rule following allows for agency, then. <laughs> no, then, then, That's inconsistent with Afro-pessimism. Well, yeah. The other problem I have is even the notion of pessimism and optimism. Because, you see, the, 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 
It's been a lot. I mean, for, for millennia over millennia, millennia, people have sought the predictable. It makes them feel safe. It makes everybody think, okay, if I could just know the future, then things are set. And of course, that's one of the reasons why ontology is comforting. Because if you could just decode what the ontological structures are, then you could say, my work is Right, done. yeah. The problem <laughs> no is... Humans. No humans. No humans. <laughs> In fact, that's the fantasy of capitalism. The fantasy yeah. of capitalism, of course, yeah. is, to get the, is to create a world, paradoxically, of profit without people. Right. 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 That's, yeah. the, that's the project. It's, and it's, so I'm clearly a, crit a critic of capitalism, which is one of the reasons why my work isn't anti-Marxist. My work is about the problem of... Of, of collapsing Marxism into an ontology that t takes yeah. away from it its creative potentials. Right. The, uh, the, this uh, is Gram. This is Gramscian Marxism. That's one yeah. of the reasons I love Gramsci. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, he's hard other to read. Things, <laughs> well, uh, but he also had to be writing in a way that the he's, censors. He was trying to get around. He's also president. He's in prison and trying to write on yeah, it. Was, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not his fault. It, so. it, it's, it's, and he was, he was doing his best within his yeah. time. But the thing, the big problem I have with the Afro pessimists and the Afro optimists mm. is the very notion of optimism and pessimism. Mm. They miss the point, is what I argue. Uh, and this is where the existential point comes because you see, I see the human being as actual, uh, actually a divergence from being. The human being, as an upsurge, to exist is to stand out, which means you're not isomorphic. You're not in a one to one relationship with, with a determined reality. And that's because human beings produce meaning. So from that understanding, the, 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 the problem I have is this. It's not only that we exist and thus pose the question of our freedom, but it's also a reality that in that emergence is also a new, a new concept and it's power. And the problem I have is that too many people when they ontologize power or they ontologize human beings, they, they, get, they ultimately collapse into the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes mm. because it just becomes coercive mechanisms right, of everything exactly. going that yeah. way. However, if we understand the creativity of power, which is the ability to make things happen and having the conditions of doing so, then the potential is endless. Yeah. And so here's the problem I, I, I have, not just with Africans, but all pessimisms. Right. But I, it's the same problem I have with optimisms. Mm which is that they, 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 they take an important element out of the human world, which is in having the condition be forecast, we don't have the genuine understanding of courage and the human capacity to deal with difference. And because all right. forecasts and pessimism are based on similarity and similitude. Absolutely, yeah. And you know, I argue that people have the ability, narcissistic love is I love you because you're like me. Mm -hmm. But there's another kind of love which is understanding you're not like me and that your capacity to bring into the world things that we could all learn from and cannot predict is something that's beautiful. So the problem I have is that I argue, and as we know, the Afro-pessimists, but not just the Afro-pessimists, a lot of the people who argue pessimism and mm -hmm. optimism, they bring, that, they, they bring these notions to politics. Yeah. And the problem I have is this, which is that Politics, I argue, is not about actually forecast. Politics is about commitment. In other words, when there's a real political struggle. So you're, you're defending pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Well, it's not pessimism of the intellect or optimism of the will. This is the part that's paradoxical about it. What I'm saying is there are certain things that you could actually really believe you're going to fail, but the commitment means doing it. And the example I usually use I use two examples. One example I love to use is Harriet Bailey, Frederick Douglass's mother. Uh -huh. Because a lot of people talk about Frederick Douglass, right. but they don't realize that Harriet Bailey had no reason to believe when she was walking 12 miles for six months to see a seven-year-old child that that child could love her, that child would even have a future, anything. And then, you know, she died. But she instilled in that child something he didn't think about before, which was the fact that he had value beyond commodification. Hmm. In other words, the world told me he's only valuable the extent to which he was a tool uh, or, or something that could be sold by the master. He suddenly had this value of being loved. But what I usually argue is that if he stays simply at the presumption that because his mother loved him, he's special, mm -hmm. he could be like one of those, those, those uh, he could look at his fellow enslaved and say, well, unlike you all, mm -hmm. I have my mother's love. But at that point, there are many examples of those people, 
right? They could become full of themselves. What made Frederick Douglass revolutionary and emancipatory is that he understood it was not simply that his mother valued him, is that he needed to value being valued by her. And the world he was in basically argued that to be valued by an enslaved woman is not to be valued at all. Hmm. And so once you can take the position that people whom the structures deem not valuable are sources of value, that undermines the very presumption of value in that system and becomes revolutionary.